Hello everyone and welcome back to our series on energy modeling fundamentals with Honeybeam. And in the previous videos, we worked towards building this energy model of a single family home. And finally, in this video, we're gonna get around to actually simulating this model in Energy Plus and getting energy use results from it. So let's dive in here. I'm gonna make this screen full grasshopper. And in this video, we're finally going to be engaging with this simulate tab that's a part of the Honeybee Energy tab and has a few different components for helping us run energy simulations with the models that we've built. The main one that we're going to be working with is this HB model to OSM component. So I'm just going to drag and drop this onto my canvas right here. And I'll note that the OSM stands for Open Studio Model. So Open Studio, as you've heard me mention a few times throughout this series, is the kind of software wrapper around the engine that is actually going to compute the energy use under the hood, which is Energy Plus. And we're going to get a bit of a deeper understanding of what exactly is going on here over the course of this video. So first off, let's try and connect the inputs that we need for this model to OSM component to run. And the very first thing that we need is that this, this input model has failed to collect data. And that's exactly the same model that we've been working with up to this point, the model that we've been building of this single family home. So that's connected up to here. The next thing that we need is something representative of the climate or the weather. And this is in the format of an EPW weather file or Energy Plus weather file. And you guys may remember from our previous video, I actually already have an Energy Plus weather file that is suitable for our climate, which we can use for this purpose. In that earlier video, I was using it to just check the asteroid climate zone to make sure that the construction set that we had applied to our rooms back here was appropriate for the climate zone that we were designing in. And so I'm going to actually tr first try and reuse this Energy Plus weather file here. I'm going to delete the this stat file component because I no longer need it. Uh, and just using this, this download weather component and the URL that I have here, I'm going to take this EPW file that's uh, coming out of this component and simply connect it to our HB model to OSM. All right, so we've got two out of three inputs down that we need. And I'm going to now just connect up a Boolean toggle for this write, which is the last required input on this component. Uh, and I'll simply do that by double clicking on the canvas, bringing up a Boolean toggle. And I can go and connect that over to write. And you'll see the component will no longer be orange now because we've specified all the required inputs. Uh, but nothing is going to be coming out of here yet until I set this right to true. So I'm going to go ahead and double click on the false here to set it to true. And we'll see, hmm, something interesting happened here. So the, our component turned orange. So that, that means that the component still ran successfully, but we have a warning because something somewhat unexpected happened. And so whenever this happens, whenever you get an orange component, it's usually a good idea to check, to click on the little orange balloon and see what's going on here. And we see we get a little message telling us that the there is no DDY file input to simulation parameters, and there was no DDY file next to the EPW file. So, I mean, putting aside the nitty gritty details of this, this message aside, it essentially sounds like our, our EPW file, our weather file that we have as input for this model, doesn't quite have all of the information we might want in order to do the most accurate energy model. Now, I know there are a few different weather files that are next to this, uh, this location uh, that we saw in EPW map in a, in a few episodes back. So I'm just going to go and maybe try a different EPW weather file to see if it will be suitable enough for our, our simulation here or if that'll essentially make this warning, this unexpected warning go away. I, I should say though, importantly, just because you get a warning doesn't mean that your simulation is wrong or that it can't be executed. It just means that maybe you wanna take a look into to some of the alternatives. It's just, it's really just an FYI for your information. So, all right, let us go and uh, bring up the EPW map component, this LB EPW map. And I'm gonna bring up a, a button in order to uh, just connect this up to our input of our EPW map component and click that so that I can open up EPW map in one of my favorite browsers. Okay, and we'll see. Remember I had said this house was somewhere around Burbank, California. And let's see, we'll go back here. And if you guys remember, I think the EPW file that I originally pulled was this uh, Department of Energy one from here. Let's see, maybe we can just try one of these other ones that's in a, in a slightly, you know, it's not too far away from it. I'm just gonna copy this one to my clipboard and we will bring it over into the grasshopper scene. And I no longer need this EPW map component, right? Because I already opened up EPW map in my browser. 
So, all right. So with that URL of that EPW file copied to my clipboard, I'm just going to double click on the canvas, type double quotes, and hit Control V. And so that'll put that URL inside of a panel for me. And now I could just go ahead and try and replace this, this other EPW URL with this, this other one, which I know is not too far away. Should still be a good representation of the climate. But we'll see. Hopefully it has more of this information that makes this, this warning go away. And if I connect that up to the weather URL, sure enough. All right. So this weather file has a little bit more information, which should be suitable for our energy simulation here. All right. Now I'll just delete this one for now. I think this is good enough. Okay, so we can see that we do get some outputs now from the component now that it ran. Specifically, we're getting some outputs of this JSON, this JSON's output. And just to explain briefly what this JSON's output is, so this is a Honeybee JSON or a .hp JSON file. And essentially, this is the saved file of the energy model that we've constructed here. So if you ever want to reload this or basically reconstruct the, your energy model from a previous simulation, all that you need is this HPJSON file. And in fact, there's a component under Honeybee, uh, I believe it's simply called yeah, HP Load Objects, that would be able to load up that HPJSON back into Grasshopper and, uh, and essentially give you your reconstructed model object. So this is useful if you ever want to, let's say you've done, finished running your simulation and you want to load up your model in the future, you can just make sure that you have the file path, this HPJSON, connected to this HP file, and that'll allow you to load the model back into Grasshopper. You'll get essentially the same output as you would from this HP model component. But all right, let's put that aside. So we have our model being saved to a file. We can see it's happening in this component. We also have this OSW file, which is an Open Studio workflow and basically has some instructions for how Open Studio should translate our, our Honeybee model over into the, the native Energy Plus format. But I think that's all that we have right now because, yeah, okay, none of these other files are coming through because we essentially we haven't actually run the simulation. We only wrote out the input files for it. So if I want the simulation to actually run, I'm going to connect this Boolean toggle to the run input. And you'll see as soon as I do that, we'll get a pop-up window that gives us a bit of a progress report on how the simulation is happening. And in fact, you can even watch the, the simulation progress through the year. I see January, March, April. Uh, it's going through all the months of the year, essentially, if, if you saw in that really quick snapshot. But this was a really fast energy simulation to run. And that's primarily because it's a small model. It's just a single family home and it's just one room of a single family home. So, okay, now that the simulation is actually run, we have some of these other output files coming from the component. And in particular, we have this, this OSM file, which stands for Open Studio Model, and you guys may recognize that was also in the name of the component here. So Open Studio is, is that, that software layer that is essentially helping us translate from our Honeybee native format over into the raw format of the simulation engine, of Energy Plus. So essentially what, what is happening to our model here, right, it's first getting written as a JSON file, which is our Honeybee native format, that's getting translated into an OSM or Open Studio model, which is actually a, a text file that you can open up in a text center, or you can open it in an application uh, called the Open Studio application, which you guys may have seen all the way back in the installation video. Right next in that compatibility matrix, right next to Open Studio, there is a link to a Open Studio application. So you can actually open this file in that application to check some of the, the uh, defaults on it. But from Open Studio, our model is then being translated to this IDF format. So IDF, it stands for input data file, which is probably the most generic name I've heard for a file type. But uh, importantly, this is the native file format of Energy Plus. So all the way at the end of the day, everything gets written into this IDF file, and this is ultimately what is simulated, what is executed in order to give us energy results, energy simulation results. So all the other files that we have output from this component, these are all result files from the simulation, and we're not going to be covering all of them, but we do. I'm going to delve a little bit into this SQL file uh, in this video because this SQL, which stands for SQLite, it's a it's essentially a database file. And this contains all of the results, practically all of the results, I should say, of the energy simulation. Now, the one thing to be aware of with the SQL file is that it isn't, it's, it's a kind of database compressed format. Uh, so it's not something that you can easily open in a text editor to check results like you would, let's say, for, with the CSV file. 
So you do need some special software or some grasshopper components to be able to parse it or read the data out of that SQL file. But the really nice thing about it is that it's for the amount of data that we're storing in this file, it is it is a lot of data a lot of the times that is going into these. And it's very nice to have this all in one place. You can easily send this file to someone else if you want them to to be able to check the results out. But all right, let's let's start off by trying to parse some of the results out of this SQL file. And if we go back over to the HP Energy tab, you'll see there's a whole result parsing section. And in particular, particular, all of these six starting components are mostly made to read different types of outputs from this SQL file. I'm gonna start with this HP end use intensity, uh, which some of you may know as energy use intensity. And energy use intensity, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the most basic metrics that, that we pull from energy models. To give a refresher for those of you who, who may not be as familiar with it, energy use intensity is essentially just the, the energy use of a building divided by its floor area. So the units of that are, are typically in, in metric, they would be kilowatt hours per square meter of floor area. In the IP system, those would be kilo BTU per square foot of floor area. Most of the time we're gonna be working in metric. The results kind of come natively out of Energy Plus in metric for us. But the reason why energy use is so popular and so well used is, I mean, not only can you use it to kind of get a profile or understanding of of what's going on in your simulation like you see in this bar chart here, but allows you to easily compare the performance of buildings with one another. So for example, if I wanted to know, is this particular single family home that I simulated actually that energy efficient, I can compare it to the energy use intensity of a typical multifamily residence in the US, which is around 200 kilowatt hours per square meter. Importantly, if you're gonna use EUI like this, you need to compare buildings of, of the same type to one another. Because, for example, let's say that I end up with a, my, a multifamily residence that has an EUI of 300, and I can say, oh, this is such an efficient building because it's using way less energy than a typical hospital in the U.S. Uh, so that's not a fair comparison to make because hospitals are, in general are way more energy intensive. And we'll get into some of the reasons for that in a later later video. You guys will actually get a pretty good, I think, intuition for what goes on in hospitals and why this number is so much higher than, let's say, an office or a multifamily residence. For now, I just want you guys to know that it's very important to compare only the EUIs of similar building types to one another if you want to use it as this kind of measuring stick for energy efficiency. The other thing that, that makes it very useful is it allows you to compare design options to one another. So let's say if you want to check the energy benefits of a few different strategies, let's say patching leaks in an attic of a building versus putting in a whole heat recovery system versus changing the thermostat. You can look at the change in energy use intensity projected with each of these strategies and then determine which ones are worth more time in investing in, which ones may, may save you more energy or not. So, okay, now that we did a refresher on ex what exactly EUI is, I'm going to connect up my SQL file of my, my single family home here to this HB end use intensity. And the component will run immediately, it should be pretty quick. And let's look at the outputs here. So we have an actual output of EUI. And if you guys hover over the, the input here, it'll tell you it's in kilowatt hours per square meter by default. Certainly that could be changed over KBTU per square foot if you were to change this IP input over to true. By default, it's false. Uh, but we can see actually our results here are kind of in line with that graphic that I just showed you, right? We're getting an end, end use intensity of about 184 kilowatt hours per square meter. Our typical residence in the U.S. has a, kilo, uh, a uh, energy use of 200 kilowatt hours per square meter. So that gives us some confidence that our model is, is probably on the right track here. At least it's, it seems comparable to typical residences that we'd find here. Going down the other outputs that we have here, we also have the energy use broken down by the, the various different end uses. So if I take this here, at first we'll just see a list of numbers, but this list is meant to be coordinated with the end uses that come out of here. So I'm gonna just, I copy and pasted my panel here and I connected up one to the EUI end use and one to the end uses. And you can see, we can put these two side by side to one another. So we can see actually the vast majority of the energy use of this single family home here is heating, which is almost surprising given that we are in Southern California. So I, I am a little bit questioning exactly what's going on here, or maybe this is one of those things that I should really look into or really make sure I understand. And, and we're gonna get to that in a later video. 
But importantly, I want you to see what that you actually can get a breakdown of the different end uses of, of the building uh, here. And lastly, we have the floor area, the, the square meters of the floor area, such that if you want to convert this energy use per square meter floor area into aggregate energy use, you simply just have to multiply these two using the a native grasshopper multiplication component like this. So, all right, so now that we've actually run a simulation, uh, we've gotten some results. They may not be exactly what we are expecting for Southern California, but at least they were they seem to be on the mark for a, a typical residential program in the US. So in the next video, we're going to delve into really trying to understand how this simulation ran and maybe get a better understanding of these numbers if, because now we know what the energy use is, but we don't really know how it got to be the way it is or, or maybe more specifically why it is the way it is. So in the next few videos, we're going to delve into this and thank you guys for sticking it out through this one and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.